the dollar is getting stronger for some very bad reasons, meaning bad in terms of the macro economy, what's what probably lies ahead, what is probably telling us. Um, so let's just maybe step back and not be Larry Summers for a minute, but just be everyday investors and asset allocators and analysts and and say, um, and I hate to use the word conundrum because Greenspan used it, but conundrum is a fancy way of saying I don't really understand what's going on. But um, but this is a conundrum for a lot of people because they look at it, the U.S. objectively, okay, our, our debt to GDP ratio is over 130%, highest in U.S. history. Um, tons of research coming from, um, obviously, Ken Rogoff, but... Welcome to Zero Sum Investing, where we provide news on the world's financial markets. Remember to smash the like button and subscribe to us. In a recent interview with wealthy on famed economist Jim Rickard said that the dollar will continue to get stronger. However, the reason for this is actually quite scary. He said that the dollar gaining strength is a conundrum for a lot of people because the debt to GDP ratio of the US is over 130%, which is the highest in US history. At that debt to GDP ratio, you cannot grow and there are only two ways out of it. Default, which is an unlikely political scenario, or extreme inflation leading to hyperinflation. Rickard said that the US economy is in a recession despite what the Fed says. And he believes that this is because, firstly, GDP has been declining for two quarters, which is the definition of recession. And secondly, even if the economy is in a recession, the Fed and often the US government won't admit it until they're in recovery. Rickards also explained that the reason unemployment is at an all-time low is because the statistics ignore the 8 to 10 million capable Americans who are not in the workforce full-time. If you add people of working age that don't have a job to the mix, unemployment is actually closer to 10%. Rickards also talked about the baseline deficit of a trillion US dollars before an extra 2 trillion for Trump's COVID relief is added, as well as yet an additional 3 trillion for Biden's COVID relief. That adds up to a sum total of an $8 trillion deficit over just two years' time. Really, Carmen Reinhardt, Vincent Reinhardt, and others, but many others, not just them, that says um, at those debt-to-GDP ratios, you can't grow. Uh, you, you can maybe refinance and muddle through, but it always ends either in um, default, which is unlikely because we can print the money, that much is true, or um, extreme inflation where here's your trillion dollars back, Good luck buying a loaf of bread. So we'll we'll see how that plays out. But the way it's playing out in real time is that the U.S. economic growth is incredibly weak. So we've got high, uh, sky high debt to GDP ratio. By the way, when you look at other countries in the world, you say, okay, who who's at that lunch table? You know, 130 percent. The answer is Lebanon, Greece, uh, Italy. The, those are your those are your, your lunch partners, so to speak. And this not, is not like that. the scene from Animal House. Would you like to meet <laughs> yeah. Clayton, Jugdash, and Muhammad? <laughs> that's, that's a good that, that's a good comparison. Um, economic growth is weak. Uh, we're in a recession. I don't care what Janet Yellen says. I don't consider her expert on the topic. But we've had our two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Like it or not, that's the definition of recession. Um, the fact that the National Bureau of Economic Research which is a private group, by the way, but they're the recognized referees on recessions and recoveries. The fact that they haven't said so doesn't mean anything because they never do say so until you know nine months or a year um, after it happened. And for that matter, most recessions are two quarters, some three. Some have been longer, but but most recessions are a couple of quarters. The, the National Bureau of Economic Research usually declares a recession after it's already over. Like it started, it happened, it's over, we're in recovery. And they go, oh, by the way, we had a recession last January. Uh, okay, so they'll probably get back to us, I, I would bet heavily, after the election. But um, we'll hear from them at some point. But we're in a recession now. And people say, what about the third quarter? Um, and it's interesting because I do put some weight on the Atlanta Fed GDP now. I, I do think it's a very good tool. It, it, they miss sometimes, they're not always accurate, but it's the best tool out there. But very few people understand their statistical technique. Because uh, what Wall Street does, uh, you, you get a whole bunch of components uh, for GDP and they come in at different times with different lags and you add them all up and you get GDP. Um, and what Wall Street does, they look at what they have and they project all the rest based on regressions and correlations, which you know, don't necessarily hold up. But this, okay, here's what we think. Here's our forecast for third quarter GDP based on 
uh, projections of what we don't know. Atlanta doesn't do that. Atlanta takes what we do know, hard data, and they ask a different question. They say, what would GDP be now if this was all we had? And they put out a number. But uh, they don't guess at the stuff they don't have. And it fills in as it goes along. So it's much more Bayesian in that sense. Um, but because of how the data comes out, the, the time sequence to which the data comes out, it typically fades as the quarter goes on. It's not because they're using a uh, bad methodology. It's just because that's how they do it. Um, and so just in the last uh, week, nine days or so, it went, you know, everyone was cheering. I think with, uh, September 1st, it was 2.3%, maybe a little higher, but about 2.3%. Two days later, it was 1.6, and now it's down to 1.3. So it's following that pattern. I would expect by the end of September, we still got three weeks to go, given what I said about how it fades, it, it, it doesn't have to be negative, but it could very well be negative, maybe three quarters of decline in GDP. But whatever it is, it's going to be weak. So if it's positive, you know, two tenths or three tenths, I mean, that's, okay, but you're still rounding our away from recession. It doesn't mean the problem's over. So uh, debt to GDP is sky high, economy weak at best, probably out of recession in the first half. Maybe that's continuing. Um, people talk unemployment close to an all-time low, went up a little bit in the last report. Yeah, but even at 3.5% or so, uh, that that is extremely low. I mean, I go back to the 1960s and uh, that was that was low, low by the measures of the 1960s. But that completely ignores probably eight to 10 million Americans who were, were perfectly able of having jobs and working, um, prime, you know, prime age, 25 to 54 years old, who are not in the workforce. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, that measure is picked up in labor force participation rate, which is uh, uh, low. I um, mean, that was, that peaked around 70% in 19, sorry, in 2000, uh, main, up from the 1970s. And that was women coming into the workforce and other factors. Uh, but now it's down to around 62% and change. It ticked up a little bit in the last report, but it's still extremely low. It's never 100. I mean, there's always, you could be, um, a homemaker, a, a student, um, they're, they're uh, retired, early retirees. There are a lot of reasons people aren't in the workforce, but not you know, taking 10% off a 14% decline uh, from the starting place in um, uh, over 20 years. That's uh, So if you, if you throw those people into the, un, they're not called unemployed because they're not looking for jobs, but if you threw them in, unemployment would be closer to 10%, which is a recession or depression level, actually. Um, so, and, and I could go on, but the point is there, there are all kinds of signs of weakness. So, you know, if, if we have the deficit, uh, where, um, you know, the baseline deficit is a trillion. That's before uh, an extra two trillion for Trump's COVID relief, uh, an extra two, three trillion for Biden's COVID relief, if you include the uh, ludicrously named Inflation Reduction Act right. and, <laughs> and, you know, and, and the American Rescue Act and uh, the Infrastructure Act. Call what you want. It's it's still three to four trillion. Mm -hmm. Two for Trump. That's six on top of two baseline. That's eight trillion dollars in two years. So your deficit's out of control, and your trade deficit's out of control. So what's not to like? Um, and yet you, you look at all that. You say, "What are you kidding me? I mean, get me out of the dollar. Get me go get anything else. Uh, why is the dollar so strong?" And the answer is for this: you have to go behind the curtain. You have to look into the, what's called the plumbing of the international monetary system. And I had a discussion, um, and this goes back, this is 1980. Uh, so I'm a, you know, an up young, up and coming vice president of Citibank. That's back, uh, back in the days when it was a bank before they turned it into a hedge fund. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm like a 27 or whatever, a 28, maybe year old lawyer. Um, but I'm, I'm talking to Walter Riston. It's you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation. He was, mm -hmm. for those who don't know the name or don't recall, he was probably the second greatest banker of the 20th century after Pierpont Morgan. So I'll give Morgan the prize, uh, mm -hmm. but he, he left around 1910. Uh, but, um, and Riston was the inventor of the euro dollar. Oh, so the, the, the negotiable certificate of deposit, euro dollars are around a little bit earlier, but he, took the CD that that, that was your interest in the euro dollar and made them negotiable and tradable. Um, so I'm having a conversation with him and I I had just seen this movie, which I highly recommend, Chris Christopherson, Hume Cronin and Jane Fonda. It's called Rollover. 
Uh, and it's, again, 1980, but all-star cast, yeah, 